Hey, what's up, y'all? Thanks so much for joining the Paging Dr. Shonda podcast. I think I'm too hype. I'm going to redo that. <laughs> Yo. What's going on, everybody? You are now listening to the Paging Dr. Shonda podcast, where we talk about all things related to mental wellness, faith, and the culture. Today, I have a very special episode lined up for you. I have two of my very good friends coming. But before we hop into that, y'all know I love to start out with shout outs. This week's shout out comes from Derek Parks from YouTube. Derek Parks simply said, this was powerful. Even though that was a very simple comment, I really appreciated that, Derek, because it showed me how valuable that information was. Without further ado, we're going to jump into the hot off the press segment. I have two friends who are going to be helping me with the rest of the podcast. Fellas, please join. What's up, y'all? Thank you so much for joining the Paging Dr. Shonda podcast. Do me a favor and introduce yourself to the audience. Hey, good people. Brandon Johnson, host and creator of the Black Mental Wellness Lounge. Dope, dope. Oh. Word, word. Shout out to Brandon. Shout out to Dr. Dr. Sean. Um, I am Philip Browntree. Wait, like, now since we're doing edits, can I edit? I'm not used to editing now. Can you, can... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I'm, I'm so not used to edit so now I'm like nervous uh no peace 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 I am Philip Browntree licensed clinical social worker from from Philadelphia uh the host of rhetorically speaking a, a live daily digital show and the hashtag you good man podcast hey I love it I love it I love it so both of y'all have amazing podcasts and they're centered around mental wellness, especially in the Black community. Um, like I said, we're going to be talking about a very special topic today. And I do think when we're talking about Black men's mental health, because the field of psychology, and y'all can disagree with me and have a conversation about that if you, um, if you differ, but I think the field of psychology or behavioral sciences in general, they're very centered around women. And sometimes when we have conversations about Black women, Black men, Black women are inappropriately centered at those times. Uh, so I thought it would be great for y'all to join me. And I'm going to let y'all do y'all thing. And I'm not going to be talking as much in this episode. Got it. I'm with it. All right. Let's, 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 let's. Uh, you got sound effects too? Oh, you rolling in here. You, <laughs> let's, you rolling. <laughs> nah, and, and we keeping this in. We rolling, right? Like, I appreciate the, the authenticity. It's, it's the glow up, man. That's why. That's why I appreciate you. You know, I appreciate you because you, you know, you keep it real and, you know, have conversations about topics that are important to, to black folk, which is, you know, super meaningful to, to myself. And I'm sure I speak for Brandon as well that, you know, we appreciate this. Yeah, I appreciate y'all for real. I really do. And listen, we're not editing none of this out. I, I'm loving the somebody's car rolled by just a couple seconds ago. We had a doorbell. I love the rawness of this sound. I think it just speaks to how raw this conversation is going to be. Like, like, let's get into it. All right. So the hot off the press segment. So unfortunately, this weekend, um, we had tragic news that the actor, producer, writer, Regina King, and um, her former partner, Ian Alexander, their 26-year-old child, unfortunately, completed suicide. This was a tragic and a shock to our community, especially because Regina King is one of those voices in the Black culture and Black community that we grew up on, from Boys in the Hood to, you know, all those throwback music movies, Poetic Justice, like all that. Um, because she's been around for so long, there was a there's a presence about her that makes us feel like we know her and we're a part of her family. And so me hearing that tragic news, it really... Uh, struck something in me. It became I became very tearful when I heard that. Uh, before I hop into you guys's opinions on what um, you thought when in your initial reaction, I just want to get weigh in from the PDC text community. So you guys, if you want to be a part of the Paging Dr. Shonda text community, all you have to do is text podcast to 21000. So a few people weighed in. We have Paul from Florida, who came from a, a more so a Christian perspective, but he was saying that uh, Ian was obviously struggling to talk about some of the things that he was experiencing regarding suicide. And he related suicide to uh, the spirit of suicide and what he was experiencing. And he may have found it difficult to open up about his, about his situation to his family. Uh, Jay from Cincinnati said that, I hope his mother finds peace in all of this. And um, a sister who goes by I Dare You to Heal stated that there are lots of things for us to work on, especially in the behavioral health field. She's also um, a therapist. And so, guys, I want to hear from y'all. What was your initial reaction when you heard about this story? 
Yeah, I mean, I think for me, first and foremost, condolences to um, to, to Miss King and the, the passing of her child. Like, you know, couldn't imagine the kind of weight that comes with that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, personally for me, I mean, when I when I heard it, I mean, of course, um, especially in my line of work, like doing a lot of suicide prevention work, definitely, um, you know, was was tough to hear that. Um, was tough to hear about this um, beautiful brother who died by suicide. And, and I think my other thoughts just just kind of went to, you know, this is this is something that's continuing to to happen and impact our community. Like, you know, the 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 more we you know unpack and have these conversations around mental health in the black community, which is starting to happen more because of platforms like this and the and the things that each of us are doing in our own spaces, you know, it's 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 at the point that still suicide is still the one, right? Like we we can have a little more conversation about you know, depression and anxiety a little more, but this conversation around suicide, you know, there's still so many people who don't understand that this is something that is in our community that, you know, that many of us are dealing with. Like there's so much, you know, grief and and trauma around this. And so my my mind kind of went to, you know, first the hurt and pain that, that, um, you know, his family must be feeling. And then two, you know, how can we start to pull in this conversation um, especially as black men looking at what the rates are, like how can we start to pull in this conversation around naming this issue in particular, you know, in, in our community around us? Like how do we, you know, get our brothers to the point that, you know, they they feel that we can we can talk about this. Like we can get a little more closer to like, I'm having a bad day, stuff really messed up. Like I don't know why I'm getting through this. But that one part that they won't necessarily get to is is that part about having suicidal thoughts, and that's a that's a tough thing to to, to yeah. say and, and to pull out, regardless of what may be going on. And so I think for me, it it went to that, and there you know still always so many people who are so you know shocked by this of just like oh they had this they had this they had everything, and you know understanding that that what's happening in in here like this can't always solve, right? Like these things that we have around us can't always solve it. So how do we, you know, bring in that conversation where we can start to heal as a collective um, to, to make sure our brothers are all right? That's such a great perspective, Brandon. Um, I love how you brought up the fact that, yeah, you can have everything, but people see that on the outside of what's going on in the inside, how we can have more conversations about that. Yeah, still waiting. Yeah, I mean, for me, you know, seeing it, you know, when I I think I saw it like a couple minutes after it came across my timeline mm-hmm. and I, I reposted it and it was like, um, you know, I, 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 I grieve for for Regina King. Right. And their family and and navigating that loss. And for me, you know, that's really the hard stop for me. Mm-hmm. And, and I say that because. You know, as I, I know, and I made a post about this on Instagram, like as clinicians, it's our our natural inclination to pathologize situations, right? Whether we have, uh, you know, a little bit of information or a lot, yeah. right? And so when it came to him, like nothing came out, right? Nothing came out, whether he was depressed um, or or you know, whether he had a med, uh, a terminal illness, right? None of this came in. They just said, hey, you know, he was a beautiful spirit and that was it. And so for me, it was it was really resisting that urge mm-hmm. to pathologize and in effect, you know, use him as this as this exemplar to um, as it speaks to suicide. That's good. Right. And so, I, you know, I say that because and, and I'm different than a lot of clinicians. Right. Um, and, and again, I'm somebody who experienced suicidal thoughts literally for like 10, 12 years every day. Um, my, when we have this suicide conversation, right, I, I'm, I'm not one who says who's anti-suicide. I, and I'll be frank, right, because I think about it. If somebody's terminally ill and I deserve, I desire to leave Earth on my terms, who am I mm-hmm. to get in the way of that? Right. If they're making that that decision. Now, what we know is what we know from individuals who do a, a attempt suicide but are unsuccessful, that, you know, many of them are experiencing some type of, um, you know, whether it's short term depression, uh, short term, short term traumatic situation or what have you or something long term. 
right? And they say, hey, um, I'm I'm glad I was unsuccessful if they indeed get that, that the requisite treatment to help them uh, alleviate whatever was present. Yeah. But again, for me and for him, it was just like, I, I just had to resist that urge to, you know, to pathologize that situation because I, I have no, I have no information. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, you know, again, the more I start to think about, you know, suicide and what took, what that took me to is I was listening to Dr. Greg Carr of, of Howard University, you know, he, his, his mother transitioned at, at 93. And he, he was talking on Saturday about this notion of death and dying when it comes not only to Black folk, um, but when it comes to just you know, Western civilization, right? And it's just like, what if death and dying wasn't this, 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 we, we view it as a negative thing, right? Mm -hmm. But what if it's just an a, a alternate way of being, right? And so even if I was to apply that to Ian Alexander Jr., um, what if that was just a method to, to continue to live in, a, in an alternative space, mm -hmm. right? And I know that, you know, when we, when we have these types of these existential types of conversations, right? It can be uncomfortable, it can be, but I, I think for me personally, right? When I, when I do start to hear about suicide, because the work that I do now is directly re a result of a young black boy here in Philadelphia dying by suicide, Emmanuel Sloan in, in 2016, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, again, I just, as far as the clinician aspect, it's just like, yo, I'm reserving, re just reserving, you know, uh, reserving the right to speak until more information but ultimately it's just like yo i hope that that family um copes in a healthy way right mm -hmm. and the most healthy way when it comes to losing your, your seed i couldn't imagine that yeah that that was so good and so many thoughts kind of uh were sparked while you were talking phil and first of all i just want to respect and honor the fact that you're you you're open about being someone who experiences suicidal ideations and suicidal thoughts. As a black man, I think that's so profound. Um, and I, I appreciate you for sharing that because so many people are gonna hear this who are also black men who might feel like I can't talk to anybody about this or I'm the only person experiencing that. So that was a moment of vulnerability and I see you, I appreciate that. Um, while you were talking, you mentioned like basically coming from this space of like non being non-judgmental about it. I think in our profession, especially there's this, like, like we're used to the data. We're used to the numbers. We have to memorize, Oh, suicide is the 11th leading cause in America. Like these are things we have to memorize. But oftentimes I feel like that causes us to be desensitized. Like these are human beings going through real life experiences <clears throat> and you know, us coming from that non-judgmental perspective, yeah, it looks like us, you know, making sure we understand we don't know what the young brother was going on, what was going on through um, his mind, his spirit, his body. We don't know what was happening in the family. And therefore, we have to just be careful when kind of making those types of assumptions. So I don't know. You guys take it away from me. Yeah, I think, as, you know, I, I think about uh, Ashanti Davis, who she was 10, I believe, in Ohio who died by suicide some years back, which was a direct result of bullying and a direct result of adults not doing what they were supposed to do, right? And protect her. And so in that instance, it's much easier for me to say, yo, this didn't have to happen, right? And maybe more will come out with Ian Alexander Jr. Like, hey, you know, maybe this didn't necessarily have to happen, but I know for, and again, for a lot of the, the, the you know, folk who, who die by suicide, you know, we recognize that it doesn't necessarily have to happen, but for some reason, um, you know, they, they feel that whatever they need, they need met, it can't happen here. Right. And I, and I try to empathize with that to just today, um, an actor is Michael Madsen. He's from, he was in like Reservoir Dogs. He's one of those, 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 uh, actors where you don't know his name, but if you see him, you'd be like, Okay, yeah, I know you, right? Mm -hmm. His his son died today by suicide at 26, right? And so it's like, but it does make you question, right? And I think that's where, you know, we, we get into like, yo, what is happening, right? What's happening beneath the surface? Mm -hmm. um, you just wish you had more, you know, more clarity, more answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I totally agree with that. And I, you know, the point that you made about, 
like like these are people like I just tweeted that like maybe yesterday right like you know as we're seeing these you know these numbers go up first of all where they were at before is unacceptable where they at now is even worse right but that these are our people right and this is this is our community and even you know, I, I think the other piece of it is that even when we don't know these people, we can grieve. Like you said, you know, you shed some tears around this. Like we can collectively grieve around this. So, you know, to, to Phil's point about like death and dying, how are we processing this as a community? Like how are we making sure that that grief and loss piece that we're in, you know, engaging in that? Because this is, this is you know, this isn't, this is tragic. All of them are tragic, but it isn't isolated. And as a community, they're becoming more widespread and they're getting younger, right? Like, and, and that's 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 the other piece that, you know, I think about with this, like having, I have two kids, my kids are 10 and eight and we start looking at suicide at five, right? Like looking at that, like this is, you know, for for us as, as a community, like I really feel like this is one of those things that, you know, to explore those tough conversations Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to in engage and kind of figure out, you know, how to navigate this, because this is this is a community, um, you know, issue that we're seeing. And then, I, you know, watching social media when this happened, like we were it was a collective grief that was happening. And so like figuring out like how we engage in that collective grief, because once we figure that out, we can figure out how to collectively heal. Right. And, and how to make sure that any others that will experience this, their family and friends, can also have that process of, of, of healing also as complicated as that process may be, us being in a position to try to aid people along in that path while we're also grieving ourselves. That's so good. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, he, he brought up something and, you know, I, I, I wanted to just get your thoughts on it, right? Like, you know, Brady talked about this idea of community healing and community grief, right? Because like, you know, I'm 38. So, you know, I remember Regina King on, on 227, right? And so like, you see the the maturity the and, and the evolution into, you know, where she is to today, right? And so it's just like, that's a part of the, this, again, this collective, like who we, who we are and what we mean to one another. And so I, I was, and I, and I still don't have the answer to this, right? Because Breda, you know, spoke eloquently about this idea of collective grief. And I saw an outpouring on social media. And I saw several tweets that said, and again, this isn't representative of everybody, mm -hmm. right? I recognize that's because that's what social media try to get you to think. Like you see one person drawn, oh, that's everybody, right? But that's not the case. But it was like, yo, can, can y'all please stop adding that woman in in your post and i was like initially i was like yeah stop adding her but then i'm like i don't know that's like yo telling somebody yo stop showing up to their crib to give their condolences right like how we used to do as community yes. I, I don't know i and so i'm conflicted with it because i see both sides of it so i just wanted to get your thoughts yeah no I, I think that's an amazing thought and to be honest phil um that kind of, it crossed my mind as well, even when developing the, the template for this episode. Uh, I, I want at first, like I wrote down like Ian Alexander, because I wanted him to be centered in this conversation. But when we talked about, when we talk about like collectivism and how she, like she's impacted by this too. Uh, one of the reasons why and it, the thing that like really evoked um emotion and just caused me to like emote uncontrollably after hearing this story was just seeing how uh, the relationship she had with her son like there were several videos posted about <clears throat> talked about him like you know he he makes me proud to be a a woman like I know I'm a good woman because I'm a great mother and she being a mother was a part of her identity and then I started to think like you know how how dare I kind of exclude her from the conversation because it's impacting her as much as it's impacting, you know, everybody else in this situation. I don't know. I, I could have a, a different perspective, but uh, that's just where I was coming from. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, you brought up a good point. I saw the same thing, Phil. Like, I saw um, a bunch of people that were, like, vehemently, like, going into posts, like, you know, mm -hmm. untag her and things like that. And I, I do think it's a balance. I don't know if it's the right answer, yeah. you know, to it. It's, it's like, um, at the same time, 
you know, you know, we get, you know, she's grieving and understand what's what's taking place. And but at the same time, it was such an outpouring. I mean, just like constant, I mean, nothing but you know, condolences and well wishes and things like that. I didn't see any craziness on any of the posts um that people were putting up. So that could be a sense of community in that in that sense. I mean, I I feel like it may get down to an individual thing. But yeah, I saw the same thing and, and I felt the same way um, initially. And I was like, yeah, um, but you bring it up that way. It's like, I can see how it could have been a part of her healing process because I don't know what it's like to be a public figure. She does, like you said, for, for you know, her, so much of her life has been a, a public figure. And so they may see, process those things differently and so having all of those people pour in may have been something that is beneficial to her. But even as I as I'm kind of like hearing you guys talk and just thinking more about it, like that's really how we process grief in our community. Mm -hmm. Like if somebody passes away, unfortunately, what's gonna happen? We're gonna show up to their mom crib with like three hams, three turkeys, and like mm -hmm. we're gonna do all those things because that's how we show up for our community members. We go to the family, we uh provide words of affirmations, we we give gifts, money even sometimes, food. Um, and I think you know, that was just we were kind of seeing that depicted in a virtual sense, like on social media. We couldn't show up to her house and give her like some flowers, but we were able to kind of show her love in that regard. Um, yeah, so I, I see both perspectives as well. Yeah, I and you know, when we talk about this idea of community, it's funny, I was in I was in therapy with a, uh, you know, working with a sister yesterday mm -hmm. and she just happens to follow me on social media. Like I knew her before I started, I didn't know her well, right? Like, you know, somebody on social media and we started working together and she was like, yeah, because I want to talk to you about your post because, you know, I, I felt it in my spirit and I feel like you was talking about me. I was like, I was like, nah, you know what I mean? But she was like, yeah, that, you know, that Bell Hooks post, right? And it was just like, it, the, what the post talked about was how um, community has always been the primary love for Black folk, yes. right? It's always been community first. And what happens is white folk, a salute to the white folk who are tuned in, Right. White folk made romanticism. Right. Yeah. The number one love. Yes. And so, you know, and so when we talk about romanticism, that's when we get into the individualism and all of that. It's about me and my feelings and my emotions. But when black folk have been operating since the beginning of time from a, a community perspective. And so, you know, you know, we've shifted, which is, you know, it's a good thing. Right. Where we we've adapted. Uh, and they say like black folk not not together and not what you know, how do we bring ourselves together? You know, we see in, in times of, of tragedy with folk we don't know, right? And how it'll be an outpouring of support. I'm not on white Twitter, I'm not on white Facebook, but I know when black folk post something like they went through something or they're going through something, it's like everybody is black protectionism. We come to the defense of, yeah. right? And yeah. even if we don't know, right? It's just like a word, let me let me get ready, right? I got your back, I'm gonna support you. And it's just something that, when again, when we talk about community and death and dying and, and grief, um, I think we've adapted to to using technology in our favor in that in that instance, because it helps us as well, right? I don't think it's any shame in you saying, you know, that you cry because of it. And it's just like, and, and I don't even know if it, it has to be reflection of, well, if I'm crying, I know Regina's crying more. No, we're just honoring our, our feelings, right? Because we are just all connected. And I think, you know, it's something that we, we lean into and we embrace. Like, yo, I feel this way for somebody else. And I think if we had more of that, uh, we may have less of, you know, undesirable outcomes. Yeah, no, that's it. I, I love where this conversation is going in terms of like that. Uh, the communal aspect, because that is, that's African centered, right? That is yeah. who we are as people. And even as we kind of go into this conversation of like, like you guys said, that collective grief, from the standpoint of like black men, I'm wondering what would that collective healing look like? How, how can we facilitate that? Or what should that look like? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I have the full answer to that. Um, but I think that you know, as you know, like as we we talk more and and 
and share and kind of figure out like, um, I, I think the one thing that I tell brothers, like when I'm in conversations with them is to, you know, understand that, you know, we talk about, you know, when Phil kind of broke down, like how we've transitioned that, you know, collective into an individual, you know, mindset, you know, I think a lot of that goes to, you know, pain and grief also. Like there's so many brothers who experience the same things. Like we go through the same challenges we, you know, experience things the same way. Like, you know, like, you know, before social media, we didn't all connect with each other in this way. But as like memes and stuff come out, you start to realize you had the same childhood as like everybody else. Like, you know, so much stuff like that your parents did, somebody else's parents did, or you had to deal with like, you know, street lights come on, you got to go in the house. Like everybody's parents had street lights is on, you come in the house. And I feel like in the same way, we go through the same kind of stuff. Like, I mean, I, it's not going to be one for one, but we go through a lot of similar things and we'll be around each other and may not necessarily, you know, want to share because we feel this pride of, of, you know, talking about some things that we're going through or, you know, some of our weaknesses or some of our experiences. When the crazy thing is that there's so many other brothers around you right now that are going through the same thing or have been through the same thing. And so if, if it takes, you know, I've told people, it may take one brother to knock down that first wall that's in front of them. And then as they talk, you can see the, the walls around the other brothers start to crumble a little bit and you can get into those conversations. And so I, I think even get into the sense of the collective of we as, as black men collectively feel, you know, certain pains. We have similar, you know, challenges, whether it be law enforcement, whether it be trying to, you know, develop and, and cover a family, whether it's, you know, financial and, and dealing with, with those things. And a, a big one also was inadequacy. Like there's, there's a time so many brothers feel like I'm not doing enough. Like I'm not this person, like I'm supposed to get to this level and I'm not there. There's something, there's a, a, a flaw you know, somewhere with with me. And and as a part of that, I feel like if we can get to, you know, if if we can get to a point where we're all talking, we're all having these conversations, we can start to drop some of these walls down. And I think that that's the first step. Like when we understand that, you know, we're all in this together, the same mess that this person had dealt with, somebody else has gotten through it. Right. And so if we can make that do that and operate it in a place that's safe, in a place that's non-judgmental, and in a place that's designed for healing, like not necessarily enabling, not necessarily, you know, you know, in, in that sense, or, you know, that ha has a lot of like bad ways to cope with it, but really like engaging to, you know, to heal and just be like, listen, I did the same thing. Well, that stupid thing you did, because sometimes it's not everything else. Sometimes we do stupid stuff, right? Period. <laughs> and so, like, I've done it before. This is how I've recovered with it. If we can figure out a way to, I don't want to say drop the pride, because pride can be useful, but how we can develop it into a way that we can really, you know, engage and start to knock some of these silos down. And again, it feels talking about, like, rebuilding this community aspect where we're safe and comfortable with each other and start the healing from there. Whew, this conversation is so good. Okay. So now that Phil is done fighting his phone. Um, <laughs> I know. And Brandon, and Brandon handled it like a champ. I don't know who, if y'all <laughs> listening to it in the audio, I'm sitting there doing 360s with my phone, <laughs> trying to get it stabilized and he's still going. I would have been lost track and like just yeah. stopped. Like, but no, no so salute to you, so salute to you for sure. I I got it situated now because it was things are just happening over here, man. But no, I completely agree with, with what he's saying. I, I liken it to um, you know, addiction when it comes to, to individuals who engage or indulge in, in drugs and alcohol, right? Uh, you get to, you know, folk, you know, become sober a lot of times. They just get to that point where they're just tired of feeling this way, right? You get tired of feeling this way and you take the necessary steps. And it's not saying you're going to be perfect along the way, but the impetus usually is like, yo, it could be something traumatic. It could be an event. You could just be tired, right? You got to be at your low. Um, and so when I think about this idea of, of Black men and, and, and emoting and, you know, you know, doing away with the tenets of, of masculinity, I think about, you know, things like, um, I, I think about things like 
wanting to commune with others, right? Tired of feeling the way that they are feeling. I know when I started the group, uh, the hashtag you good man men's group at, at Uncle Bobby's, you know, the brothers came was just like, yo, I just want, I needed something different. I just wasn't being fulfilled in, in the ways that I was told that I was supposed to be fulfilled throughout my life, right? Whether it's, you know, whether it's, it's sex, whether it's, it's drugs, alcohol, uh, 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 you know, academic attainment, whether it's, um, you know, uh, 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 achieving some level of, of monetary status. It's just like, yo, I'm, I'm tired, right? I, I want to be, I want to feel more, right? I want to have healthier relationships. And again, it's getting to that point where it's just like, yo, yeah, I have my surfacy relationship with my homies, right? And that's cool. And that sustains me and helps me. But I want to have deeper relationships with people. You know, I, I think about, you know, myself and how a lot of my, like my, I have my, I'm not going to call my relationships with, with my homies like surface level, even though we talk about surface level things 99.9% of the times, they are meaningful relationships. But I know with my women friends, right, we're, it's, it's layers to this, right? If I am feeling something, I know I can contact them and go in, in depth without uh, the, the, the typical response of from a homie, like, yo, you tripping or or making a joke about it, right? When you try to be serious and what that could do, that could cause people to shut down. So uh, I say all that to say, I think for, for a lot of men, it's just getting to that point where they desire something more for themselves. Again, maybe that's the theme. Yeah, you, both of y'all are saying such um, amazing things right now. And even kind of going a little bit further, uh, y'all, and... The reason why I had y'all come is because I feel like y'all can talk extensively about this. Um, I recognize like there are shortcomings that I have when it has when it comes to talking about this because this is not my lived experience. So you y'all are talking about this sense of inadequacy. Inadequacy um, is the common theme, right, for black men. How does that show up? Because like I often get questions, whether it's through inbox or in therapy, from other men about this sense of inadequacy. Black men. And it's like, I can refer you out, I can refer you to a black man, but I just don't have that type of um, information and knowledge for you. So as black men, I'm, I'm going to use y'all to my advantage right now, like to tell the audience, like what that looks like, how that presents and like, yeah, like what, what does that look like? Yeah, I mean, you want to go first? Man? Yeah, and, and I mean, I feel like in any number of ways, I mean, one, like I said, it, it, it comes in so many different, like it, it can come in so many different areas, right? Like the feeling of inadequacy can come in so many different areas. And I think one of the, the, the how it can present is a, aggression towards the thing that you're inadequate about, right? So like, if you're thinking about like, I, I wanna get to a point where, you know, I have, you know, this relationship with, with this person and I'm not getting it. So you may be trying to date everybody, right? So you can try to get, you know, that person locked down and get that, get that thing figured out. Or if you're like, I'm, you know, I'm inadequate because I don't have, you know, my finances in order or my money's not. So you're gonna try to hit every come up, you're gonna try to hit every lick, you're gonna try to do whatever you can to try to get there by any means necessary. And it gets to the point of usually taking those aggressive methods don't necessarily work. They don't get you better outcomes. So then you get frustrated. So then the irritability starts to come in and then you start to, you know, then it's you against you, right? Like you're starting to, to challenge yourself or like, why can't you, right? It's like, why can't you do this thing that as a man that you're supposed to do that you see other people doing flawlessly or easily? Like, why, why can't you do that? So I think it starts to come up with that self-doubt. But I, I mean, I think a lot of times it, it turns into you know, um, you know, desperation and then frustration with yourself because I can't fix this as quickly as I wanted to, because a lot for a lot of things with us, we're solution oriented. So we like if there's a problem, I should have a solution. Like I should be able to figure it out and I should be able to do it quickly. Yeah. Right. And so I, I think it, it, it goes into um, a lot of that. And then, you know, if you're not able to do it, you know, there could be substance, you know, abuse challenges. There could be, again, that internalized, um, you know, doubt that could lead to depressive episodes. I mean, it can, you know, it can start to spiral if you don't, you know, kind of get it in check. And I think a lot of that is understanding 
that you there are no checkpoints in life that you have to get this by this point. You have to do these things. But in not getting there, like that's a real thing to sit with. Like I've I've been there certainly, like, you know, for, for sure. Like even like for me, I wasn't always good with my finances. Even when I, you know, when I got with my wife, she was the finance person. She was all money was straight, credit score, crazy, like all this kind of stuff. And so we about to get married and she like, let's talk about this finances. And I'm like, why? Because you're getting married, dummy. That's what, that's what's supposed to happen. But when you get into that sense, like I feel inadequate there. So my natural disposition is starting to go into anger. So when you bring it up, we can't talk about it because I start to get angry and I find a way to blow the conversation into something else. And then we don't talk about it because that's where my insecurity is. But if we, you know, figure out how to address it and understand how to how to manage it and, and deal with it. And again, understand the process that goes along with it. You know, then it starts to get a little better, but it can come out any number of ways. But a lot of the times I see it as like frustration, particularly around the thing that you feel inadequate about. But you haven't had that internal conversation with yourself of this is an insecurity because I feel inadequate in this space. Mm. Mm. Wow. No, that's good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I think you, 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 you know, again, eloquently touched on my bad. Again, the phone keep dropping, man. And I, I think, I think you, you setting off some. You shaking the room when you, That's when you, 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 you speak at gems, and the phone just falls over, right? Um, so I, I think you you talked about like you know what's happening in the, in like the day to day, some of the things. So we know that's not an exhaustive list right. of what you know impacts how folks show up. And I guess this is the portion of the program, <laughs> right, where uh, you might get the you know the hate comments in, in the YouTube section and stuff like that. Uh, but a, a, a lot of men uh, subconsciously desire to be white men, right? And so I, and when I, when I talk about that, what I mean by that is, you know, this lack of identity, right? Mm-hmm. This lack of, of who I am, right? And again, like, like Brandon was talking about. And so we try to find these different means to, to help us you know, figure out what our identity is. And that's why we see such a, a large uh, portion of, of individuals who graduate with business degrees are what? Are men, primarily white men. But then we see black men not too far ahead because it's just like that. Again, you know, I, I, I subconsciously desire to have what it is that that you have, right? And so what we're talking about, and also we again, and that's just the the idea of of white supremacy and capitalism mm-hmm. and and patriarchy, right? And how when we talk about how that impacts our day to day, so this blunted emotion, we just got finished having a whole conversation about how who we were and who we are, right? Because I don't think that never leaves us. We just might forget from time to time, but we've never been uh, a people that have blunted emotion. Mm-hmm. Right. That was never us. You know, men, women, again, even this, these whole gender roles. Right. And gender concept that wasn't popping in Africa like that, you know, back back then. And so we've adopted some of the, the unhealthy mannerisms and characteristics and, and ideologies of an oppressor. Uh, I, I think about um, Nikki Baldwin, Nikki Baldwin, might as well call him Nikki Baldwin, Nikki Giovanni and James Baldwin in their conversation. I encourage anybody to watch it on YouTube, then watch the, the, the analysis that we had on, on, at Phil MSW, uh, uh, where, you know, shameless plug, where they were, t- you know, Nikki was talking about how the black man shows up when he gets home from work, mm-hmm. right? And she was like, yo, you smile in this white man face all day, right? He kicks you. He tells you what to do. You just keep smiling, right? Knowing that you're seething inside, knowing that you're feeling pain and anger. And then you come home and take it out on me, take it out on your kids and and what have you. And she's like, yo, why can't you lie to me? Right? Why can't you come and and just like you lying to him, come lie and and give me that fake smile. And Baldwin's like, you know, because the bills got to get paid, right? That's why I stay in these situations. And it's just like, She's like, no, they're going to get paid, though. Right. I need you to believe that we we going to be good. And again, this when we think about the community aspect, like, yeah, we know bills are a very real thing. Yeah. Right. But does this mean that you have to to endure? And I think for so many black men, it's just like, yo, we've endured for so long. Right. 
we've had to to be you know strong why we had you know quote unquote strong whatever that means Mm -hmm. we had to be that why because if you weren't you know you're gonna get killed right because you're not the the strongest uh enslaved person and so you adapt those characteristics and you take them with you um as you go you know go forward so i you know i say all that to say that we can't ignore you know how that influences you know you know, Brandon, when he, these kind these, these insecurities related to it, right? Because this narrative has been pushed that you a boy, you're supposed to have your money right, you're supposed to have your credit score at eighteen thousand or whatever the high number is, right? And, and so again, this is their system and how they operate. And even though we app, we you know we we're in it, but we don't have to be of it, right? right? And so if we can be mindful of, but everybody don't know that. Right. So if I'm having this conversation with brothers that come to the group, we might have, have some who understand it and some who like, yeah, I don't know what you're talking about this. But, you know, uh, this person on my job getting on my nerves. Right. And this is because. And so, again, it's it's just the, the understanding the root cause and then the practical offering practical reasons and solutions um, as it manifests itself. Yeah, man. Listen, I know. <laughs> That why is powerful. It's yes. heavy. Seriously. Seriously. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, that, that capitalism piece, that white supremacy piece is, you know, is so evident in even what attainment looks like, right? Mm-hmm. Like we are looking at, you know, people in systems that have built to and have built on the backs of other people and people have attained things in that way. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this the system that breaks it shouldn't be our goal it's a flourish in these systems. Like the systems are the things that are holding so many of us back and have lifted up so many other people up. So even changing how we see success and attainment, you know, is, is, a, is another one, like even pulling, you know, obviously we need those, you know, the money and those things as well, but even figuring out like, what does success look like in these areas, you know, for us, like, how do we figure out like what that means for us beyond what we've kind of been indoctrinated into? That's yeah, that's a great point, Phil. Yes, that can be a whole episode though. Listen, like, yeah, I- yeah, yeah, listen, because then we got to get in the conversation of of how hip hop has fucked everybody over. I, mean, I know this is a religious podcast somewhat. <laughs> I apologize. Not- <laughs> it was until that moment, right? You're probably gonna bleep me out. Bleep me out in the in the in the final cuts. Uh, <laughs> but no, but but if we if we think about people of a certain age, yeah. right? People yeah. of a certain age, if you're a black man that's yeah. that's under 50. Hip hop has been a, a, a the, the most important outside influence in your life, right? Beyond your parents, mm-hmm. I, I would say. You know what I mean? Just because, again, it impacts your relationships. It, it impacts the the types of relationships you have. Uh, it impacts the the you know job. It impacts how you how you view yourself, how you view other brothers, right? right. Like again, we talk about. You know, hip hop is like we, like we, like Brandon and I. If we, if we went off the, the tenets of hip hop, we're supposed to be competing with, with each other right now. Now, who could say the most right now, and you know, who could get the most airtime, mm. right? But in reality, we recognize that how does that benefit others, right? And so, because why we're unlearning certain things, yeah. right? When it comes to it, it's just like, no, you're not my competition, right? Because competition breeds. You know, it's a it's a breeding ground for anger, for pain, for frustration, for right. for whatever, right? Uh, even when I see like the 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 corny cliche, like I, you know, I'm my own competition. It's like no, the hell I'm not, man. I'm just doing what I got to do right. to you know to live well. Like I'm not because once I get this notion in my head, it's just like I always got to be doing, I always got to be achieving, I always got to be doing something because I'm in competition with myself, What's and I doing? you know. Right. It, and it's and it's taxing, but again, so many black boys, so many black men mm-hmm. are up against that. That's where the value is associated with. That's that's where their value is. Is what they can produce and how high they can climb. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And then we got to think about like going back to that conversation about like racism, oppression, capitalism. All those things have even impacted some of our core values and like what success means to us. Um, and even like emotions, how we emote, emotional suppression. Like how would y'all say for black men that has been impacted by like racism and oppression? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to what Phil said, like this mentality of you can't show weakness. Mm -hmm. That lets you slut can't show vulnerability because vulnerability can be used um to to damage you or to or to harm you. Like there's, you know, that connection associated with, you know, um like tears and sadness being, you know, being weakness. Like there's so much into um, you know, into that, you know, that you you have to deal with. And even you know, talking about that conversation um, that, that you mentioned with James Baldwin, like I, I, I loved it. I've watched it so many times, but it's like a part of that is, you know, I have to suppress my emotions, you know, in these in these situations because I need the job because they control the jobs. I need to make sure that I don't, you know, I got to keep my emotions in check if I engage with law enforcement. If law enforcement stops me, I have to keep you know, those things in check because that could mean my life, right? So like, as, as you think about those things, like there's so many places that we naturally as a survival technique have to keep those things, you know, locked up. If you, uh, you know, get rid of them or, or express them in other places, like it, it feels unnatural, right? Because you spend so much of your time trying to keep it in this, in this bubble that it shouldn't have to be in, right? And so like, it's not natural. And as Phil mentioned earlier, we were talking about this collective piece, this wasn't how we were. So now that we have to adapt and assimilate ourselves into systems that have been meant to oppress us and kill us, mm -hmm. when we get the opportunity to share those things, it feels weird, right? It feels off. I don't, because I don't even spend enough time with them to process them myself because I have to keep them over here for my own safety. And that's the, you know, a lot of the thought that goes into it. And I, I think unpacking that and sitting and giving those safe spaces where we can say, you know, you can sit with this emotion and it's okay. It doesn't make you any less than that you experience this, this emotion off of this. And then too, I feel like sometimes then it comes out in other ways, like what we'll small frustrations that like get us like riled up because it's so pent up and we don't have other viable yeah. avenues to, to have those things. And so I, I feel like that, is 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 part of it like thinking about like how we navigate these things that we don't always have access to because we feel like we can't hmm. yeah I, I i agree um you know we talk about this pent up you know feelings and emotions and, and what have you again when i was when i was running the group in person uh, i vividly remember this time it was a, a 70 he was, he was in his like late 70s and he was a bit of a grump Right. Um, an older gentleman. And he was like a, another gentleman was in like, his, you know, more in like his late early 50s or something like that. Late 40s, early 50s. And he said something. He snapped back out at him. Right. And we in the midst of the, the group. And so, again, this is a group for anybody who identify as, as as being men. And, you know, so they going back and forth. And folk are like, yo, you ain't gonna stop. I'm you're not gonna stop it. Like it's getting tense. And I, I felt like Babs and uh make the band like, no, nah, let them fight, let them fight. <laughs> right. Just because, like, if this was if this was out in the streets, right? If this was out in the streets, it would be all right, we might have some words, I'm never talking to you again. We might have some words, I'll punch you in the face. We might have some words, um, you know, I might do some some other type of violent harm to you, right? And, but in this in this space, it was it elevated. We had conflict, and, and y'all clinicians, y'all know, healthy conflict is is we embrace that, right. you know, because we need to be able to see that that it is possible that you can have this conflict and go up, right? Then we still we can come back down, whether we gotta agree to disagree, um, mm -hmm. talk about what took place, process it, or what have you. Um, but I am I, I that was probably one of the, the most impactful moments because I was like, yo, we don't see that. Right. We don't see the healthy uh, conflict like we, you know, uh, you know, Doc, you talked about, you know, black women. And, you know, I would argue, you know, black, you know, no black folk, no person of the global majority is in the, the thinking of, you know, psychology or psychiatry and, and you know, meta, you know, modern medicine at all, right? Like we're not a part of that. But y'all saw that with Insecure. Y'all saw Issa and Molly beefing for, for you know, episodes and for seasons. And we saw the ups and the downs and the ebb and flows. And you try to sit and think about black men who has some ups and downs. It just, and on shows, period. And I'm like, can't really think of any. 
right? I, I can't. I haven't watched this new show, Grand Crew, or something. You know what I mean? Because I don't like you know NBC and white folk and them having a hand in what we do, right? But I can't think of that. I don't have that imagery. The imagery that I get is you know Jim Jones and Freddie Gibbs beefing, fighting, something on the shade room, something more media takeout of black men in conflict. Right. And so like that narrative is consistently pushed. And so when we talk about representation, like a lot of times folk get caught up in 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 you, right? And skin tone. But it's like, no, where's the representation of the brothers who had beef and the beef escalated, mm-hmm. right? They have conflict and it escalated. Where's the representation of you know brothers loving one another? Right. Where like where are the 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 different types of um you know, representation of, of brothers, just again, loving one another, you know, it's, it's just like, it's just non-existent. And so that's why it becomes important for, for, for us to really have those conversations and, and speak to it, whether it's Brandon, whether I'm just thinking of the top of my head, Rashawn, or, or, you know, Paul Bache, you know, I call him, my name Paul, I call him Paul, right? Uh, you know, just thinking about these, these folk, you know, Aaron and, and a bunch of other folk who, who talk about, Black men, and not just them experiencing trauma and stress, but also show the, showing themselves right. in loving, vulnerable lights. I think that in itself is, I would I will argue healing. Like Black men being able to just see Black men, no treatment occurring, just being able to see them talk about being vulnerable, being mm-hmm. open about emotions having those conversations about a group where, you know, two old heads was getting into it. Like that in itself is healing for a lot of black men, because like you said, that representation is lacking on TV, media, et cetera. And I know you took it back to media takeout. When I think about black (laughs) men in conflict, I'm thinking like, dang, there really isn't. I mean, a couple episodes on love and hip hop and stuff, but like we talking about healthy conflict. Like, so I don't know, like y'all, y'all brought up so many great things. So many amazing uh, gems were dropped in this moment. So, word, yeah. You say love and hip hop. I'm like, I'm trying to think, like, who, who would that even involve? Like Safari, or <laughs> I don't, I don't know all, all the people on there. Right. But yeah, it's but you you think about these things, right? Like, I, I know I do when I'm sitting watching shows with two or more black men that just happen to be in it. Like, I, I think about Insecure, right? We got, you know, whether it's uh. Dang, they names escaped me already, right? They had the conflict Lawrence, Lawrence, Nathan. Nathan. Lawrence and Nathan at the baby shower. Yeah, not the baby yeah. shower. Was that the baby shower? Whatever, whatever that was. Yeah, it might have been the baby sh- The going away party. Going. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they had that little war, you know, who penis is bigger contest. Like, we get that all the time. You know what I mean? And, and so not to say they were wrong for doing that, mm-hmm. right? Because that happens too. It was good to see that that was the extent of it though, right? And it didn't go to anything further because a lot of times, especially when it's over a woman, we know that it can elevate, right? Because right. it's like, you know, it's this idea of property and ego and all these things, you know, intersect. So, but yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's and, I, and I hate even saying there's nothing out here, right? Because we know like all of this stuff is curated, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so it's like, I, you know, I think about, there's so many YouTube-based web shows with creatives trying to show us in light. We just don't see it because it's not curated for us. You know what I mean? So I, I, I take that back. It's out there. We just have it. It, it has been put to our forefront. You got to work hard to find it, which right. I guess, again, is a, a theme of all of this, working hard. Right. I mean, I, I guess we got to. If, if we want to, like, heal and all that stuff, it comes with working hard and having the resources right sometimes we don't have access to that and like you said like imagine if those ideas from those creators were like funded or like people did care about black mental health in our communities and they wanted to put our stories out there so that we can have more representation and seeing people who look like us in media or what have you like i think a lot of this could be eliminated like a lot of the things that we experience day to day uh could be significantly improved if people cared, uh, which I, I don't, I don't see that right now. Yeah, yeah, it it really depends. Like it's like once you said that, I really started going through my like TV database. <laughs> I'm saying like, man, it's gotta be one, and I'm like, 
drawing a blank. And I was like, it's it's true. And that and and that plays into it too. Like you brought up the, the music piece, like all that, you know, plays together. And a lot of it is even subconscious. Like we just like, yeah, it's just music, it's whatever. Like, you know, it don't, you know, get to me. And I said that for a, a long time. <laughs> but you know, you realize like those things do play into that. And you know, if we can't collectively get together, you know understand our emotions and problem solve like you know that's that one mm-hmm. so that that representation trying to build that definitely is 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 important yeah and now i got you sleep now i'm going down the roller decks and i'm going through songs and stuff and so then i start thinking about the song like what is it help me be the best man i forgot who was it was it <laughs> rl or rl joe I, I don't know who it I was but, about, yeah, yeah but they but they sing in the women and i'm like i, I like imagine <laughs> Like imagine if they were singing it to like another brother, like like brother, help me be the best man I could be. Yeah. What that would what, what the response would be? That wouldn't even see the light of day. You know what I mean? It wouldn't see the light of day. Yeah. But it's so necessary though, Phil. Like yeah, I, I, y'all talking about it now. Like black men seeing other black men and pushing other black men on emotional suppression, like managing healthy conflict, all those things is so necessary. Uh, so. Yeah, I I would want one of y'all to write that song and to sing it to one. <laughs> Brandon, you yeah. can sing. Yeah. I, I can't sing. So, well, yeah. you said right, not sing. So, yeah, that, that I wasn't given that by the creator. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's not my <laughs> well, well, we probably have, though. If you look at some of the songs, how they, you know, how they are today, it's just like you can say anything at this point. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and, and get it popping. It's, it's interesting. It reminds me of, um, like I was an honoree amongst like and like fifty to a hundred other brothers for Black Enterprise, their uh Be Modern Man, which they like, you know, That's nominate it. brothers who are doing good things and you know in their community. Like we all came together. Uh, it was in Miami one year, and then it was at a, a another. It was at two golf. It was is at like uh two golf resorts. Nice, you know, the amenities were were all of that, and it was funny. Like I got on the plane, and you know. You know, I got the I'm from Philly. I got the Philly, the Philly scowl on, right? And I sit next to a brother, and you know, he kept wanting to bust it up with me. And I'm like, I'm thinking in my head, like, dog, leave me alone. Like, I don't, I don't know you. Like, why are you trying to talk to me? Like, what, what's what's up with you, right? Even this, and this was only like, you know, maybe within the last four years or so, despite unlearning a lot of things. It's no different than when we walk past another brother, like. How many people say what's up? If you smile at another brother, it's like, oh, what you smiling at? Right. We we again it's but we're always in defense ball. And so, you know, I ended up starting talking to him anyway on the plane because Frank's name, Frank Brady, he's, he's based out of uh New Haven, Connecticut. And again, the, the nicest brother in the world. You know what I mean? Like he's just smiling all the time. And it was just like, again, and mind you, I'm going down here to be surrounded by brothers. And I, I had to have this, this honest dialogue, like, fam, like, what you want? You want to stone the face the entire time, right? <laughs> you're around nothing but brothers. Yes, there's going to be women down there as well, but you're going to be majority brothers. You want to scout of your face? Like, what are you going down here for? And so once I stepped off that plane, it was just like, yo, what's up? Yo, what's up, brother? How you feeling? Oh, and you, and you realize, like, oh, Philly different. Right. The, the rest of folk from different places, they smile and they're ready to embrace you. And, and, it's, and I've, I've formed, you know, formed so many relationships just from, you know, my couple years going down there. Right. Where yeah. and what it did was it is and shout out to, you know, my old head, Alfred Edmonds, you know, who, who created all of this. And it was the first time really I could say I was able to convene with other black men where it wasn't like, you know, ish talking you know it was just like genuine interest about what you're doing right and and vice versa and and it just it made you i left there feeling good right and a lot of times we leave our interactions with brothers not necessarily feeling the the best especially if it's brothers we don't know why because we don't allow ourselves that permission to to engage and be vulnerable and 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 be a a hundred percent you know what i mean and show up in situations we only know how to show up in in one way mm-hmm. a lot of times and again that's for good reason but um that just reminded me of of that situation yeah i love that you you talked about unlearning that too um because like you said like i feel like that's a defense mechanism like 
you know, we know the, the Freudians or whoever came up. Yeah, I think Freud, the white people came up with the different. <laughs> the whites, D dash whites. Right. <laughs> uh, the, these defense mechanisms that we utilize in order to protect ourselves. And like you said, like some black people, we feel like we have to constantly be in this space where we are protecting ourselves. And when it's unnecessary at times, when, we, when we're in safe spaces with safe people, it's important to recognize that and to also let those guards down so that we can be vulnerable and to receive from those situations. So I, I, I love, I cannot say how much I loved how vulnerable y'all both were in this conversation. I really can't thank you enough. Uh, Y'all, any last words? Where can the people find you? What projects are you working on? Let us know. Um, Black Mental Wellness Lounge um, on YouTube. Just look us up, Black Mental Wellness Lounge. Um, yeah, would love to connect with the folks on there. We did a um, Black Men's Roundtable on the Black Mental Wellness Lounge. So if you're interested in this topic, we just had four brothers just talking about uh, similar things to tonight. So definitely check that out. Um, Instagram at Black Mental Wellness Lounge. We we'll love to connect. Um, we we'll love to connect. Thanks for having me on. This conversation is, um, you know, it is amazing. And Phil mentioned that that Philly thing. I was like, I'm from down the road in Baltimore. We the same way. And I was like, <laughs> North, it's a Northeast thing, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, the only difference is y'all got that. What y'all say? You, you. Yeah, they that how y'all pronounce it. I don't know if you heard it, but when he was saying two, like that accent. <laughs> it was coming out. <laughs> it never failed. I think my phone was dropping a thousand times when he when he was saying it. That's why. <laughs> word, word. Um, yeah, so you, you can catch me also on YouTube uh, at the at sign Phil. So if you put in Phil, P-H-I-L, M is in Mary, S-W, uh, or look up Philip Roundtree on YouTube, you can see just the, the different stuff that I that I do, the rhetorically speaking. Um, also on, you know, all all your, your platforms, your SoundCloud, your Spotify's and, and all those white folk owned stuff. Uh, you can look up hashtag you good man podcast. I actually got a new one dropping uh, tomorrow. I had uh, myself and three other brothers, uh, Shimon Cohen, um, Michael, o Michael Olnick and and the uh, the hip hop social worker, Chris Scott. And we are all in different stages of sobriety. And so we got together to have this discussion on, on men and sobriety and, and what that looked like in our experiences. So, you know, if you look up hashtag you good man on all those platforms, or you could just follow me on Instagram and the Twitter at Phil underscore Roundtree. I love it. I love it. I'll definitely be tuning in. Congratulations, Phil, on your sobriety. That's major. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, word. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And congrats, Brandon. I know you recently moved and got a new home. Black men is out here doing things, y'all. Like, I love it. Um, all right, y'all. That's a wrap. I do appreciate all of you for listening. If you want to be a part of the PBC text community, all you have to do is text podcast to 21000. And don't forget, you have the power to create the emotions that you want to experience. I'll see y'all next Wednesday. <laughs>